the while we grab a hand, Michael, kind of <coughs> yeah. up, up the volume. Um, it's good to see you all again today. I thought yesterday was really exciting and kind of confusing too, right? There's so much diversity and we're, we're still working out what form factors and things like that mean for, for wearables. <coughs> a lot of challenges. I think yesterday we explored quite a bit um, that the story for wearables isn't just about what is their function, uh, but how, how, how are they signifying things? How do they position me in a sort of social dynamic or a business hierarchy? So it's a really big leap from next to your body to on your body. And it's something that we're trying to get right. And I was really buoyed to see that certainly in London and Europe that we really do care about the fashion aspects of these things. And it's important to get those right. Um, and it opens up a wealth of lots and lots of different use cases. In fact, it's mind-boggling. You can, almost anything you can think of now in terms of you know, a, an experience, you can pretty much craft it, whether it's using Arduino boards or using existing hardware and, uh, you know, munging a few APIs together. Th this is a, a piece of Exotica. It's called Aura, and it's a set of wearables. It's a, a, a dress for her and it's a bracelet for him. <clears throat> um, it, it creates up this ambient communication between father, mother, and, and the unborn child. And um, what happens is the dress senses when there's uh, fetal movement in utero, and it translates it into sort of patterns on the dress. But not only that, um, uh, dad, who may well be away at a conference or something, um, his bracelet begins to activate when the, when the baby starts kicking, and he sees some light patterns on his bracelet too, and he can begin to interact with this bracelet. Um, and again, that interaction with the bracelet plays back on the dress, and mum can see dad um, yeah, touching the bracelet, and that pattern appears on her dress. Now, it's exotic. It's a very uh, specific use case. Um, but what I think is interesting here is that smartphones could create an approximation of this, but they couldn't really deliver on this sort of beautiful, magical moment for the family. Um, what's really special about wearables is that they connect the physical and, and the digital. Um, and of course, they're using uh, various sensors and, and, and actuators to do that. Um, so they connect the physical to the digital. And um, for the longest while, I was trying to draw up some sort of experiential diagram. How should we view wearables and, and these technologies from a design perspective? Um, so I kind of sat down and I was trying to draw, okay, we've got augmented reality here. That means we've got reality over here and we've got unreality or virtuality over here. And it can get pretty confusing. Um, Philip K. Dick said that reality is anything that, uh, that which you stop believing in uh, still exists. So whether I, I, I like it or not, Zelda still exists, Hotmail still exists, so even if I close my eyes and wish it to go away. So what then do we have sitting in the middle here? Well, we have augment, we're either augmenting the physical world with data from the digital domain or universe, 
or we're augmenting the digital world with data from the physical domain. So the, from an experience design point of view, this is, this is how the traffic's moving across this fan. I, um, when we talk about wearables, they're not a homogenous ca uh, category by any stretch, and I'll go into that a little bit later on. Um, but they're also being used by animals, and, what, and you know, we talk about the physical world. There's a lot of challenges there to operate in the physical world. Um, you know, there can be heat, uh, light issues, or you know, uh, being up to your waist in a, a cow ship. This is a, a product called Moo Master, and it's a necklace for cows, or dairy cows. Um, and it can tell you all sorts of things, whether they're in heat or uh, whether they're uh, non-cycling or they have some sort of problem. But importantly, there's another social dynamic here too. I can tell if a mother has uh, lost its calf. So as, as I said, wearables aren't a homogenous uh, category. Smartphones are. They're, they all pretty much reside in our pockets or in our purses. Um, they're of a, a certain form factor for the most part. Um, and they're a grab, the grab bag of tools that they provide are pretty similar. But wearables are a different beast altogether, and I don't think it does service to the variety of the landscape by just lumping them all together. So let's explore this. I, I like to sort of um, characterize technologies by looking at, um, a sort of, I call it a time and space diagram. Um, time, what's the average session time for the particular device? Um, and space, you know, how big is the presentation space? So just to get familiar with this, let's plot a few things that we're familiar with already. This little gray area here, um, means that there's no, uh, no actual display output. So we could put things like NFC tags in there, for example. Um, it's a very short interaction time, um, but with no, no, no display. Of course, there may well be a smartphone uh, uh, twinned with it to, to give you some uh, display there. So we can plot some of our traditional tools uh, that, that brands are using on here too. We can see that out of home, billboards, digital or otherwise, um, provide us with uh, quite a big real estate, but it's kind of a short amount of time. Typically, it would be a walk by. Um, ATMs, again, uh, relatively small session. Most people can achieve this in under a minute uh, to get their money or get their balance or whatever it is. And then, of course, tablets, typically beyond one minute for a, for a session on a tablet. And then we have the wondrous uh, uh, device called the smartphone, which kind of sits and obviously connects to many of these other devices here. And typically the sessions, certainly in the UK, um, is average one minute. So roughly one minute sessions we have. Of course you can spend longer, but on average the sessions are one minute. Um, let's begin to plot some of this white space around here. You can see there's a lot of space here to play in. So let's take smart watches, for example. A, a real design challenge, I mean, Talk about designing for mobile first and how erudite you need to be with your design principles there. Designing for watches is a, to design at a glance. Can you provide value at a glance? So very short session times and a relatively small real estate. We also have things like rings, bracelets, and, and shirts. Um, uh, cute circuit excluded. They've got quite a huge display space there. Um, but typically these are, are, are worn for you know, more than a couple of hours. Um, and some either have or, or have a little bit of display space here. So we can see we're starting to fill up some of this white space here in the diagram. And then maybe lastly on the other side here, where we have long session times and a lot of real estate to play with, well that would be sort of um, uh, digital contact lenses, uh, augmented reality glasses, uh, and VR headsets. And of course, the mobile um, is, the, is the multiplexer here. The mobile's connecting to all of these. So when we talk about wearables, they are an, uh, it's, a, it's a very varied zoo of devices that we're talking about. And they have different design characteristics that we need to think about. I, um, you know, wearables have just got going. I, there's been experiments, of course, from the 60s and, uh, with wearables, um, but now we're just beginning to get some data on how, how, how consumers are uh, not necessarily using them, but how they view them. So this little Da Vinci diagram here um, sort of highlights, and, and the, uh, the speaker beforehand was, was talking about the different places that we can wear these devices. And you can see here you can wear them clipped onto cloth clothing, tattooed on your skin, earbuds, headphones. Um, but what I wanted to call out here was a comparison between how US consumers uh, view wearables and, and where they would believably wear them uh, versus uh, where uh, uh, Europeans would wear them. And it's a great story for the Europeans, actually. It looks like the Europeans are much 
much more disposed to um, uh, wearables. And I've called out three areas here um, where they're indexing you know, much higher than the US. So for example, uh, European consumers, 43% of them would wear something on their wrist in comparison to the US where only 23% would. Um, even embedded into clothing, uh, Europe index is higher here again. 21% of users versus 15% in the US. And then lastly, embedded in jewellery, um, 18%. I really like that example of uh, Ringley that was shown in the, in the previous presentation. And I know that there's a few um, exhibitors here um, showing, showing jewellery. So in these three categories here, if you want to be um, engaging with, uh, uh, with Europeans, this is where to do it. And in fact, embedded in jewellery scoring higher than glasses. So I think this is interesting. The um, wearables aren't homogenous. People, consumers have different views on what they would wear. And on balance, Europeans uh, are much more predisposed towards uh, wearables. So hooray. Um, again, on the paradigm of wearables, what, what's, what's good about wearables is that they open up context. Um, they provide us much more information about the environment or our physiological states or mental states. Um, and, and again, social dynamics. Uh, often when we're using tools and developing products and services with smartphones and, and desktops, um, when we're trying to work out what attitudes and emotions and behaviors are, it's often indirect measurements. We might use things like listening platforms to ascertain if that customer experience was horrific or something like that. But wearables uh, open up context, and they do so by providing us with direct measurements. Now, the industry isn't mature enough as yet to really um, have got those data science chops down, but we do certainly have the tools to do this. And I, we can begin to sort of move forward with um, how we look at things from a linguistic point of view. Um, neuroscience, uh, anthropology, the, uh, the chap from Intel that opened up yesterday, he reports to an anthropologist. So I think what's special about wearables is that they open up context, they're opening up new forms of data for us, and they're giving us it's direct. As some examples of this, um, I think it's probably fair to say that while the promise of wearables for consumers we all feel is inevitable, um, it's going to take some time yet. So in the interim, uh, some ex interesting examples of how uh, brands are using uh, wearables to uh, improve their products. So this is, um, this is from Channel 4, who are working with an Irish company called Sensum to debug their content, whether that is uh, advertisements or TV shows. So they hook up, uh, hook up viewers in these focus groups and Wearables are really changing how focus groups um, can be run. And they determine when people uh, are, are excited, confused, or, or frustrated when they're watching a piece of content. And it allows them to debug it beyond just simple surveys. They can look at any, a, a specific, specific frame in the video. And then perhaps uh, for, for more noble purposes, um, lots of great apps on Google Glass. Um, you can see here that um, uh, there's an application here that allows you to read emotions, and that's going to help people with autism who, who are often quite confused when, when interacting with others. So th that's a little bit about the, the, the paradigm of wearables. Um, how, how's, that, um, how's that shaking out in the market? Well, um, it's still the case that small companies lead and platforms are following. Certainly last year felt like a bit of a watershed in terms of how uh, the enterprise uh, began to look at wearables. Um, I, I took this as a strategic listening tool. So a strategic listening tool looks at social data, but it looks at I, uh, IP filings, uh, companies' house information, and a, and a myriad of other sources to try and appraise the market. Um, and I think, uh, you know, plaudits to the show organizers here. Uh, those that are getting the most chatter um, are, are typically on here. We can see, uh, there's IDC up there, uh, Intel we're speaking, um, we have us there, Forrester <laughs> Research, um, and, and many more, GearFit, et cetera. Um, and, what we're finding is that small companies are definitely leading and platforms are following. But many envisage their use or are actually rolling out these services in a business environment first, not necessarily uh, with consumers. And it's interesting because when PCs came along, um, they didn't go straight for a consumer play. They were used by business people first and slowly by osmosis, um, it began to become available to the consumers. 
<laughs> five minutes, wow. Okay, um, McLaren Technologies are coming on, uh, uh, going to speak to you later today, and what they're doing in terms of looking at infrastructure and operations and pushing that out further to measuring how humans interact is, is really fabulous, and they're going to tell you about your, their human telemetry system. Uh, Virgin Atlantic um, uh, demoed what they were doing yesterday. I thought that was uh, an excellent piece of work. I, I hope they get the funding to keep it up. And even middleware, you know, very dry, uh, dry organizations like TIBCO and their middleware platform are reimagining how the messaging bus can be improved by including uh, human beings as one of the nodes. And, it's, and, you know, businesses can more easily create uh, joined up use cases. With consumers, of course, we have to um, get through a price barrier. We also have to consider how uh, consumers are uh, changing their technology, smartphones, you know, every one, two, three years we may well change these things. But businesses can easily create joined up use cases. Um, and ultimately what we're trying to do is help people in their lives and, and make them better parents, uh, better employees, uh, better sports people. Um, when I look at the um, uh, uh, childcare market, there's a, there's a lot of promise here, um, from the comedic uh, Huggies Nappy that tweets, um, to the Owlet Socks and the, uh, the next generation Intel onesie. I never thought I would ever say that sentence, the Intel onesie. Um, but, you know, it's a complex job, and really, if th these, these devices aren't necessarily integrating with one another. They're not necessarily integrating with their food and nutrition, or my home security. I mean, my, uh, my two-year-old uh, you know, goes at speed, and I really would like to be able to track him more effectively, as well as examine his health. But when we look at it from a business perspective and the jobs that need to be done here, um, which could, of course, include uh, fighting terrorists and, uh, you know, uh, crack addicts. We can see Motorola here are really providing a fabulous vertical um, for uh, law enforcement here. There's one, two, three, about seven different devices here that are all working in concert. And it's much easier for businesses, and health's another really good example here, um, to sort of roll out coherent uh, services using a, a sort of a family of devices. So we talked about uh, wearables and how, how technology is moving from the basement and it moved all the way up into our bodies and of course it's going to move into our bodies with ingestibles quite soon. That, that market's picking up a little bit. So let's look at the ecosystem in which we're, we're operating here. We have wearables of course on our body, we have smartphones next to our body, we have smart objects, I would include a PC in that, for example, or a Nest thermometer. And of course, these are taking place in smart rooms, smart houses, streets, and cities. And this is the landscape. And if you really want to provide value, then um, looking at the, the wider landscape here um, will allow you to do that. Of course, we're still waiting on the smart street and the smart city to, to really get going. Uh, and what covers all of this, for those that are interested in linguistics and NLP, is um, uh, uh, semantic tools that allow us to classify and uh, do soft integrations between different domains and um, between the health domain perhaps and uh, the security domain. Uh, here's an example uh, from uh, uh, the, the, the MTA network uh, in New York, a uh, chain system. And what I really like about this is it sort of makes the, the Oyster card look a little bit pedestrian. Um, you can see here that um, it's multifunctional. And, and it's operating within a smart city. I can swipe to enter and pay. I can see with this little red, uh, red piece on the band here when a train's coming. And, and kind of cool, when I'm on the train, I can kind of see how uh, my, my transfers are. I can see which lines I'm crossing and transgressing. So this is a great way to reimagine how we may well uh, move our way through uh, the smart cities. And we need wearables because when we're in the city, our heads need to be up, we're active, we're busy. There's a very high throughput rate and wearables can really help there. Um, the implication of all of this, of course, is that we need to move towards a more am ambient computing. Um, we can often focus too heavily on what the cloud offers us, um, but there's lots of intelligence at the edge too. And this is something that caught my eye um, from uh, Nottingham, I think it's Nottingham State University, and they're working on smart fabric. And the smart fabric does the does the whole thing. It can sense things like strain, temperature, uh, gas, radi gas uh, radiation, acoustic motion and pressure. It also has processing in, in the fabric too, whether that's microprocessors, controllers, or even referencing the cloud. And it can act back on the uh, fabric too, whether that's to emit light, vibration, or transmission. This is a research project, it's not available yet. Um, but your clothing uh, is, a, is a very well uh, self-contained node in the smart network. 
And this network builds out and out. Uh, my clothing relates to your clothing, relates to the entry door system, etc. Um, there are some social challenges ahead. Um, often when we think about privacy and wearables, we think about big bad brands that are grabbing our biometrics data and doing horrible things with insurance. But, but there's a P2P dynamic here as well. Um, it was interesting, a couple of weeks ago in San Francisco, uh, someone was attacked uh, for wearing um, uh, Google glasses uh, in a pub and stickers started to fly up all over the city. You know, no glassware here, etc. And it's just the tip of the iceberg. This is a, a tool called Glashan that allows me to take a snap of what you're wearing and then cross-reference it with some sort of sales database and, and I can go and buy that product too. But I'm, you know, I'm treating you and your data, your presence, in a sort of cavalier way, right? I'm using you as a data source. So um, I think Europe, we, we've, we have, there's a lot of legislation coming down the pipe in Europe. Uh, the Data Protection Directive's a, a big one and that'll be uh, about 2015-16 that that will be enacted. That's a bit of a game changer. Um, so there, there, it changes the social dynamic and I'm, I'm happy about that. We need to move forward with this conversation. I know Tim Berners-Lee is looking to um, create some sort of uh, uh, baseline for how, how uh, how our society should interpret these new technologies. And wearables are really challenging. My biometric data is certainly a little bit more sensitive than my postcode, for example. So what are some of the key takeaways here? <clears throat> these devices are conduits for data. Um, big data will get enormous. These devices are always on uh, and polling. They're cre uh, creating uh, new, new different types of data. We're going to need richer trust models. With, uh, with more data, it uh, requires some automation. Automation requires trust. And that we're back into the, the sort of privacy and transparency debate. I think new social dynamics will emerge. I think that's really exciting. Legislation will uh, struggle to keep up. The EU does not know what to do with uh, the internet of things. That's a, that's a fact. Um, but they, you know, they've got an opinion about cookies. Um, Cognitive science is really going to expand, expand brand analytics here. Um, we, uh, you know, number of downloads, pop, most popular pages, number of shares, that's all very well and good. Um, but brand analytics is going to have to expand quite a bit to a new form of sense making, a new form of interpreting on what's going on in the world. Um, and we're going to see many more people from uh, psychology and, and neuropsychology begin to enter the field here. And killer use cases will come from integration. We saw that verticals and certainly business um, can do this quite easily. You can mandate that your employees do this and you don't even have to ask cows if you want to put a bracelet, uh, a necklace on them. They kind of just go with it. Um, so we're going to need some standards here and partnerships to address wider portions of the customer journey. But the winning products will turn data into insight, present it in a way that we can accept it and actually change the way that we live and work. So recommendations, um, you know, it depends on your ambition level here. Um, certainly, you, at a minimum, you need to be educating yourself about what you can do here. Um, those that have some budget should at least be putting some into uh, experimenting with partners and, and, and algorithms and what these data sources mean, how to perhaps improve the, the customer journey or right to the, right to the other edge where you're developing your own device or experiences. You need to put users in control of their data. They are wary of you. They're certainly wary of advertising and recommendations that don't have a rationale behind them. Um, demand ethics from your coders. And I think, again, one of the key messages through yesterday, be, be practical, sure, but be stylish and, and understand the context in which these things are, are, are uh, being worn. So return a clear benefit to users and select the right uh, ambition level for your brand. Well, the wearables is uh, part of uh, a series of topics that we look at in Forrester, and we have this under the banner of digital disruption, so do feel free to go to that URL and, and get in touch with us. Well, thank you very much. I, I hope you enjoy the, the remainder of the day. I certainly had fun yesterday, and I look forward to what's to come. Thank you.